he had had his heart attack here in St. John's, he may have been discharged by now. Instead, he's been in the hospital in Carbonier for the past six days, and being told he could be stuck there another two or three weeks. Now, the issue is that Short needs an angiogram, often called a dye test, that can only be done here at the Health Science Center. But Short says that patients outside St. John's are constantly being bumped further down the wait list. The Paul and Kathy Short YouTube channel gives viewers a window into the world of a rural Newfoundland Mr. Fix-It. I wanted to show you some mirrors that I put in it. Short repairs heavy equipment, restores antiques, and whatever comes his way at the shop, specialty repairs in Bay Roberts. Are we going to eat before you go back to the rest of that? Or are we Kathy Short is the channel's camera operator and co-star. But while they were filming this video last Friday, Kathy Short says their YouTube show suddenly became a life and death drama. He was working away and trimming trees, trimming branches off the trees, but it took a terrible, really crushing pain to his chest. And he stopped and he sat for a while on the tractor. And if you watch the video, and people have, they can tell in the video that he's not speaking the same and his, his breathing is differently. Kathy drove Paul to the hospital in Carbonier. While there, he suffered a second heart attack. Thank God that he was in the ER when, this, when the second one hit. And that saved, that saved his life by getting here. Now Short is feeling better, but the next step in his treatment is an angiogram, a test that can only be done in St. John's. Short has already been waiting a week and is being told he could wait two or three more weeks for an appointment at the Health Science Center. And he continues to wait here until that's done. So it's, we're at the mercy of the lab in the city to contact him. And, and I don't know how many is on the list, and no one's telling me how many is ahead of him. But then, like I said, people continue to enter with emergencies. Eastern Health says that as of yesterday, there were 13 patients on the wait list in St. John's and 19 waiting in other parts of the province. But it says the wait list is constantly changing because patients are seen according to priority not geography. The Shorts and their doctor have started an online petition asking government to extend operating hours at the lab where the test is performed. It's picking up signatures from around the world as Paul and Kathy Shorts YouTube fans discover what happened to a person they see as a star. My goodness, I had someone call the uh, ICU. <laughs> I hope that don't continue. But what of your YouTube thank followers? You, yes, thank you, James Moran in North Carolina. <laughs> he did. He called. Uh, he, he called in to see. But there is fabulous to support. We we knew they were always there and and they were supportive. But this is this has been impressive. Now, speaking of the Shorts YouTube fans, Paul and Kathy Short have just shared a video posted by one of their fans. A person named Jeff Murdoch has a video called In Honor of Paul Short. It is Mr. Murdoch's own tearful, emotional reaction to Paul Short's story. It speaks to the connection that the Shorts have with their YouTube audience. And you can bet that these fans uh, will be paying attention to this story wherever they happen to be in the world. Reporting live from St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. We have more tonight on the controversial hiring of a prominent liberal power broker in the Department of Health. Here now has confirmed the former director of pharmaceutical services was fired. His job was cut in February as part of government downsizing. Less than three months later, without a job competition, liberal strategist Jamie O'Day was appointed. Here now's Terry Roberts broke this story on Wednesday. He's joining us now with the latest. Terry? Uh, yes, Debbie. Keith Shepard was booted from that job on February 22nd, the same day that Premier Dwight Ball and Finance Minister Kathy Bennett announced 300 managerial positions were gone from government. Shepard did the job for five years and had direct involvement with the provincial prescription drug program for about a decade. But this week, a new face is in the job, Jamie O'Day, a full-on appointment, no competition, former Liberal Party pres uh, Vice President, I'm sorry, co-chair of the party's 2015 election campaign, even part of the Dwight Ball transition team. Now this sparked, this has caused sparks in the House of Assembly today with John Hagee on the receiving end.
The fact is that he's continuing his government's practice of sending some good public servants out the door while they create six-figure positions, six-figure salaries for some of their Liberal friends. Now, Hagee continues to defend O'Day's hiring, saying she's highly qualified and there wasn't enough time for a competitive job search. In February, Minister, you let the Director of Pharmaceutical Services go. You paid him severance. Uh, you did all that, and then less than three months later, you brought in someone else, a very deeply connected liberal. I mean, you must understand how that looks. As an employer, I can't comment on who was working and why they may or may not still be working in the department. I have to maintain certain confidences. Uh, it's people's lives we're, we're talking about, their livelihood, their career and their reputation. Uh, you have cast a certain light on it. I have a different view of it. Now, Hagee goes on to dismiss this entire controversy as nothing more than political mudslinging. As for Jamie O'Day and Keith Shepard, neither have been available for an interview. Debbie? Thank you very much. That's our Terry Roberts reporting live in our studio tonight. A murder trial in central Newfoundland is over almost before it started. Pamela Pike was charged with first-degree murder in 2013. Today, she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. But the family of the man who died, Jason Skinner, says the justice system has stabbed them in the back. Here now, as Chris Ensing explains. Pike sat in court this morning four years after Skinner's death and pleaded guilty to manslaughter, admitting for the first time that her actions killed him. The judge asked Pike if she caused Skinner's death by stabbing. Pike, sitting in front of her family, replied yes. The jury prepared for a four-week trial was dismissed. Pike's lawyer, Bob Buckingham, said her plea was not a surprise, considering the circumstances. Everyone wants to have closure on this. Uh, certainly she wants closure. I don't think it's... Uh, um, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, going to be a situation where Ms. Pike will be incarcerated. I don't think anyone uh, likes to go to jail, uh, but, uh, and so that's uh, disconcerting and, and upsetting. But uh, it will be uh, cathartic to uh, get it resolved and to move on with, uh, with her life. But what about Skinner's life? His family asks, dead at 34, a son, an uncle, a brother, an addict on the road to recovery. Pam Pike wants closure. What a joke. For four years, his family has had salt poured into its wounds over and over with delays while Pam Pike walked the streets. Now she wants closure in the 11th hour. What about the past four years? If she truly wanted closure, why not plead guilty earlier? This family would also like closure, but it doesn't look like it's coming anytime soon. Jason may have been stabbed four years ago, but it appears the justice system continues to stab this family in the back. For four years, this family has been knocked down time and time again with this case. But you know what? We're still standing. And at the end of the day, we will continue to stand. We can hold our head high because for four years, we have been on the right side of the law. Now, another woman, Wanda Ash, was convicted of manslaughter by a jury in a trial this February for the death of Jason Skinner. She's expected to be sentenced sometime this summer. Pike was free to leave the courthouse today. She'll be back May 17th when the judge will hear a joint submission for sentencing by both the Crown and defense. Chris Hensing, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. The province is expanding who can receive the human papilloma virus vaccination. Girls in grade 6 have received the cancer-preventing vaccine for more than a decade, but as Here and Now's Mark Quinn reports, boys will be included in the future. It's going to cost more than $350,000 per year, but the government says when you look at the benefits, it's well worth it. Evidence shows that males too can benefit from the vaccine. In this province, all grade 6 girls have been given the human papilloma vaccine since 2007. Now the province is expanding the program. Beginning in the next school year, the HPV vaccine will be available to all grade 6 children in the province as part of their regular vaccination public schedule. Doctors say the vaccine protects girls against cervical cancer by preventing the virus that can cause it. But that same virus isn't only carried by boys and sexually transmitted to girls, it can also lead to throat and mouth cancers in boys too. Uh, more than one in three HPV cancers occur in the male population. 
Until now, parents who wanted to vaccinate their sons against HPV had to spend hundreds of dollars to buy the vaccine themselves. This is clearly another important public policy that will help reduce cancer rates throughout our province and we're very proud of that. Parents can opt out of this program if they wish to and not have their children vaccinated. But the vaccination rate for children in this province is high at over 95%. And the health minister hopes it'll stay that way. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it was a close call today for a preteen riding a bicycle in Cornerbrook. The boy was knocked down while crossing a bridge. Now, this is the bike the boy was riding and when he was struck by a pickup truck. He was crossing the Main Street Bridge at the time. The accident tied up traffic for about a half an hour. The 12 year old was taken to hospital, but we're told his injuries are minor. No broken bones. The driver of the truck got in the back of this police car, but it's not clear if he will face charges. While protesting, students served up peanut butter and jelly sandwiches outside Memorial University this afternoon. The protest happened after Memorial's Noreen Golfman defended the cost of taking potential faculty members out for dinner. Golfman said, we're not feeding them peanut butter sandwiches, we're doing what professionals do. Students also voiced concerns about a possible tuition increase as Munn deals with a budget cut from the province. Students come to Memorial for the main reason for the low tuition. They're promised a low tuition when they come here. That's what, you know, that's how they recruit students is our, is our low tuition. So to hike that up is breaking a lot of promises to students. What kind of impact do you think a tuition hike would have on the university? Um, I think the, a lot of students won't be able to afford to come here. A lot of international students will have to unfortunately go home. They already pay four times more than domestic students. Um, so I think it's really unfair. We're all used to seeing paving done during the day, but now the province is testing out nighttime paving. Concord Paving has been awarded a two and a half million dollar contract to pave a 50 kilometer stretch of the TCH from Kenmount Road in St. John's to Salmonier Line. The work will cost more because lighting has to be set up, but the Carbonier company says once that's approved by an engineer, there will be a public awareness campaign to let people know the details. The work should be done by July. While the union representing locked out workers in Gander is hopeful that a labor board ruling will get its members closer to a fair contract. According to Unifor, the Newfoundland and Labrador Labor Relations Board decided that DJ Composites violated Section 75 of the Labor Relations Act by engaging in bad faith bargaining with its employees. The union says it sends a strong message to all employee, or employers rather, who think they can disregard labor laws. The unionized workers have been on strike for nearly five months. The company isn't available for comment. A Labrador man convicted of sexually touching two girls in 2012 was sentenced today. 26-year-old Shane Harris of Nain will serve 90 days behind bars. The incident happened when Harris was a guest in the girls' home. A statement of facts read in court this morning said Harris reached into the beds the girls were sleeping in and touched them. It took more than five years to reach this conclusion. The delays were caused in part because Harris changed his plea several times. In September, Harris is slated to stand trial on a charge of child luring in Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, St. John's lawyer is calling on the government of Canada to accept responsibility for cadet leaders who sexually abused cadets. There are three civil cases involving cadet leaders working their way through the courts in this province. Here now is Glenn Payette reports. Lawyer Will Hiscock has represented many clients in sexual assault civil cases, and he says in cases involving cadet leaders, victims look to the federal government through the Attorney General for compensation. I don't believe that there's a, a rationale for the government of Canada, the Attorney General of Canada, not being responsible for cadet officers. There are three such cases working their way through the courts in this province. One will go to trial on Monday at Supreme Court in St. John's. In it, Jane Doe is now suing four parties, including the Attorney General of Canada. She has just reached an agreement with a fifth party, the Army Cadet League of Canada. She was sexually abused by her Air Cadet Squadron training officer, Travis Kendall. Jane Doe was 14, Kendall was 33. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 21 months in prison and a year's probation. 
In its statement of defense in the civil case, the Attorney General says, Canada denies that it is directly or vicariously liable for the conduct of the first defendant. That would be Kendall. Hiscock says he would like the Trudeau government to handle the cadet issue in a similar fashion to residential schools and pay up. It holds itself out as a progressive government, and I think as a progressive government, uh, it has a responsibility to uh, address abuse that's occurring in inside of its institutions um, and to deal very fairly with survivors of abuse. Hiscock says that criminal and civil sexual assault trials are very traumatic on the victims and should be avoided when that's possible. We've written to the Federal Department of Justice for reaction to Hiscock. So far, we haven't heard back. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Here's that the sport of tennis is growing again in Newfoundland and Labrador, and some of these high-performance players behind me are leading that charge. I'm Jeremy, and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. While it's a decades-old mystery in Scotland, find out the Newfoundland connection behind these shells coming up. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Okay, 
our first look at the weather. Not a bad day in our neck of the woods. A uh, woods, little speck of rain this afternoon, yeah. but at least it wasn't white. <laughs> uh, that's right. And Labrador again, 20 centimeters in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a new record uh, there for uh, May the third. But to have a look at what Nain has been. Uh, just seeing the snow tapering off there that no official measurement but that looks like a solid 20 to 30 centimeters to me and as uh Thank you. yeah as they pointed out uh with this photo as garnet pointed out uh, still not barbecue season uh they're waiting on that to arrive in nain we take a look at temperatures highs today three degrees in nain one in mccovic we did get to double digits in St. John's and Terra Nova, close to it in Gander towards Badger in the high single digits. Cornerbrook topped out at six degrees uh, for today. And as we take a look at the satellite and radar picture, there's the low departing again, that northerly wind that's been wrapping in on the other side of the system, dropping the snow through Labrador. Uh, that will continue tonight. And in fact, we'll see strong northwesterly winds wrapping in around this system. Right across uh, that Atlantic coastline for tomorrow. A little bit breezy to start the day, especially here in St. John's and up the northeast coast. But winds ease through the day. And this area of high pressure off to the west will be moving in, clearing the skies, calming the winds. And so we'll see much improvement into the afternoon. And here is how it will all play out. There goes the low off to the north. Weak disturbance here tracking south of Labrador. I uh, think it could throw a flurry into the mix for places like port tomorrow perhaps St. Anthony, but I think it's going to be south of there, but it will kick some cloud cover up into the afternoon and early evening hours across the north coast of the island central and down into St. John's. So I'm keeping an eye on that, but not expecting anything in the way of precipitation uh, for areas east of the northern peninsula. As we roll into Saturday, this is going to be the next system. Bit of snow on the leading edge will change to rain for Labrador City. Eventually, it will move into uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay and southeastern Labrador through the day with some uh, wet flurries possible. I think more so in the way of showers and some scattered shower chances for the west coast on Saturday afternoon as well. Central and east will stay dry and we'll talk more about that in terms of uh, those variable temperatures we're going to be looking at for Saturday and especially Sunday with a sea breeze coming up in your long range forecast. Here is how things are going to play out by the time we get to tomorrow morning. Precipitation free across the province uh, as cold as minus 10 in Lab West, generally minus two to minus five for central and eastern Labrador and temperatures near the freezing mark for the island. Again, I think for St. John's we will hit 10, but not until the winds really drop off into the mid to late afternoon. I think our high tomorrow might be waiting until around 4, 430 into the afternoon. Perfect for home time for most of us as those northwest winds will ease through the day. And so that'll make for a pretty solid evening at six, seven degrees as those winds become light. Bit of a sea breeze into the evening. Onshore winds tomorrow will keep temperatures as cool as six. Uh, but away from those onshore winds, I think we are talking about eight, nine, ten degrees for most of us. Again, a little bit cooler towards the Bonavista Peninsula for tomorrow in those onshore winds. Central Newfoundland, note the clouds uh, into the afternoon thicken up a little bit here. Anywhere from six in onshore winds to as warm as 13 degrees degrees Gander uh, Grand Falls Windsor towards the Badger region. Nice day along the west coast bit of cloud into the afternoon eight and onshore winds to as warm as 13 even 14 degrees not out of the question Cornerbrook towards the Humber Valley. There's that uh, isolated risk of a flurry for Port de Chois everywhere else four to six degrees and for the coast of Labrador winds still a little bit breezy from the west to temperatures around the freezing mark plus five in Happy Valley Goose Bay two on the plus side in the west. We'll talk about that long range detail and yes, some RDF into next week. We'll talk about that as well. Peter. Thanks, Ryan. While their bikes are tuned, tuned up rather, the camera gear is packed and they're on the road. Two men left St. John's this morning on a 15,000 kilometer journey all by bicycle. These two photographers have set out to bike all the way to the Arctic. They plan to collect and showcase the country's landscape and our history to mark Canada's 150th birthday. They'll be filming a documentary to create a better understanding of the different Thank histories you. that make up Canada. It's a journey that they say will take them from the cliffs of St. John's to the Arctic community of Inuvik to Vancouver in a span of six months. The origin of the idea of this trip began with uh, the expectation, our expectation of Canada's 150th anniversary, which is that there would be a really strong mainstream narrative that would celebrate Canada. Rightfully so, there's lots to celebrate about Canada, but there's also lots uh, that's not really talked about in our history and in our present today. So our goal is to document uh, different stories within the Canadian experience, um, especially more marginalized stories. 
that aren't that aren't told or aren't listened to as often. What? Biggest challenge, honestly, is when you're going west to east, uh, is or east to west is the is, is the prevailing winds. Uh, it's it's difficult to get mad at, at headwind, and I suspect that we'll be facing lots of it. Um, and in in Newfoundland, anyways, the weather uh, as well as up north, the weather. But aside from that, I think a lot of the challenge is, is going to be headwinds. Other than that, I'm, I'm very confident in our ability. And good luck to them. Well, with the temperatures warming up here, tennis courts around the province will soon be filling up. But for some of the province's best tennis players, they've been training all year long to get ready for a very busy summer season. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton has our story. These are some of the top tennis talent in Newfoundland and Labrador. For 12 months of the year, 10 hours a week, the high-performance provincial training squad bashes balls around the court. <laughs> tennis used to be very popular in the province. While it's dropped off recently, it seems to be swinging back. I think we're finally starting to see the trend go back the other way. We had several years there where it looked like the sport was losing some players, but right now it's really starting to take off. We've got fantastic grassroots programs. Great. Two of the best players, brothers Aiden and Liam drover Matnan, are trying to put Newfoundland and Labrador back on the tennis map. The national event, so the whole country participates in that tournament. I finished ninth. Great experience. It's a really good, uh, really good competition. And I can't wait to play the next nationals. 12-year-old Liam is no slouch either. He's headed to Europe this summer. I'm going to Austria with Tennis Canada. I'm going with two other boys and two other girls um, and we're going to play two tournaments and train in Austria and it'll be really fun. I think it's huge right you know when you get when you get players that are role models in your community and other kids who play tennis or those that are aspiring to be tennis see players like him making a national team and doing it all by living here in this province there's no more of this we can't do attitude right it's oh well we can. not Meany says these courts are filled with talented players. Eight of them will represent the province at this summer's Canada Games. While the sport appears to be growing, doesn't mean they can just sit back and lob it in. We're pretty happy about what the future is about to bring to us, but, you know, we got to put our head to the grindstone and work real hard to try and bring those numbers even further up. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. While government is expanding a program so young boys can access a cancer-preventing vaccine that, until now, was only given to girls. The health minister explains why after the break.
Welcome back and now back to one of our top stories. The vaccine for HPV, the human papilloma virus, will soon be available to all grade six children in this province. For the past decade, only girls were eligible to receive the vaccine, but today government changed that policy. I'm pleased to announce today, through an annual investment of $360,000, our government is expanding its publicly funded vaccination program for school aged children to include HPV vaccine for all children, gender neutral, everyone. Beginning in the next school year, the HPV vaccine will be available to all grade six children in the province as part of their regular vaccination public schedule. While the initial focus of HPV vaccination was to prevent cervical cancer, evidence shows that males too can benefit from the vaccine and we're pleased to expand our program to reflect this. What you might know is HPV is a, a very common virus that will affect about 75% of Canadians throughout their lifetime. And many people don't even realize that they would, they would have, uh, have this virus. The key thing is that the HPV can be prevented. Um, the, when you look at the statistics, uh, because of HPV, almost 4,400 Canadians will face a cancer diagnosis this year. Uh, this can be prevented. About 1,200 uh, Canadians will, will die because of this HPV uh, virus and the cancer that's developed. Uh, some of these cancers, especially HPV with regards to mouth and throat cancers, are on the rise. And it's been shown through uh, research that it's on the rise in particular with males living throughout the province and living in uh, throughout uh, Canada. Uh, more than one in three HPV cancers occur in the male population. This is a population that was not receiving a vaccination for HPV until this uh, announcement today. So this is very exciting for, for everybody living throughout our province. Our coverage rates, as was said, for girls are outstanding. Uh, we should be very proud of the work that's being done throughout the province here. And now it is so, it's, a, it's a thrill and we're very excited to say that because of this, uh, males will also be included into this uh, vaccination program. Well, now to Nova Scotia, where there's a story playing out involving school-aged kids. The province's privacy commissioner has launched an investigation after unsecure web cameras in a Cape Breton school broadcast images of students to the Internet. The devices were only password protected this week after CBC News alerted the school board to the problem. Jack Julian has the story. The Rankin School of the Narrows in Iona. 135 students ages 5 to 18. They have a spectacular view of the Bredore Lake. And here's a view inside the school. There's a drinking fountain and a door to the boys' bathroom. Until yesterday, these images streamed 24 hours a day straight to the internet. The source, an unsecured surveillance camera like this one. The feed from this school traveled far. A link to the camera was even on this Russian registered website. It has thousands of links to unsecured cameras all over the world. Insecure security cameras have become a massive problem. This cybersecurity expert estimates there are between one and 200 million digital security cameras in Canada. Most of them are wide open. From what we have seen, and we audit some cameras and we audit infrastructure, uh, I would say probably only about 30% of those cameras are, are actually secure. The local school board is still investigating how these cameras became a window in and out of the school, and they aren't the only ones. We saw the images that were posted of a, a hallway near a bathroom in a school, and we saw images of a, a playground, so we contacted the school board um, to gather some more information. Tully has now launched an investigation of her own, but even if she confirms a breach, her powers are limited. In Nova Scotia and in much of Canada, the privacy regime that we have in legislation uh, doesn't really have very strong enforcement measures. And so what happens? Well, you have the privacy commissioner tapping you on the shoulder and saying you really need to do a better job. Daniel Tobach thinks it's not just privacy laws that need an upgrade. He wants to see federal manufacturing standards for all technologies that connects to the Internet. Today we have vigorous testing when it comes to product safety. We have associations, we have legislation around that. The same needs to happen for internet connected devices. Meanwhile, the school board is checking all its security camera settings to make sure this won't happen again. Jack Julian, CBC News, Halifax.
ocean currents always have a tale to tell. After the break, we'll tell you why some people are concerned about what's washing up on beaches here and on the other side of the ocean. Welcome back to Here and Now, and we want to tell you about a Scottish mystery that's gone on for decades, but now there's a solution, and it's in this province. For years, these shotgun shells were watching up on the beach in Scotland. No one could figure out where they came from. The 16-gauge shells weren't sold in the UK, but after help from Scotland Yard, the FBI, and the RCMP, the shells were traced back to tur hunters from this province. Well, this revelation helps researchers here. I met up with Max Liberon, who studies ocean plastics. It wasn't hard to find some similar shells on Topsail Beach today. What was your reaction when you heard about shotgun shells from Newfoundland washing up on a beach in Scotland? I was really excited. I heard about it actually a couple of years ago from someone in Scotland. Uh, and I was really excited because it's an it's a citizen science, really straightforward indication of where our plastic waste goes. Usually it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to figure that out. And here's some beachcomber just found them. Were you surprised that plastic from here made it all the way over there? No, plastics routinely go in the ocean and circle around the globe, mostly in these giant gyres. Ours is the North Atlantic, so it's not surprising that it's in another place, sort of near the North Atlantic. Uh, I didn't know exactly where they went, but I wasn't shocked to find out it was Northern Scotland. And how big of an issue are things like shotgun shells in terms of getting into the ocean and then getting into some of the birds, fish, and marine mammals? Well, so shotgun shells aren't the biggest issue, but they, like other plastics, will break down into smaller and smaller pieces called uh, microplastics. About 93% of all plastics in the ocean are smaller than a grain of rice, which means a whole lot of different animals can eat them. They're small enough, all the way down to plankton. You can even find them circulating in the blood of mussels. That's how small they get. And if they're in there, if they're in the animals, then the chemicals that are associated with plastics, those are the things we're worried about. So if you ever uh, have Tupperware that you've had chili in and you can't get the orange color out, all plastics absorb chemicals like that, whether it's chili sauce or DDT or oil. And when an animal eats them, those chemicals go into the animal. And that's mostly what we're worried about because we eat cod, we eat lobster, we eat birds, especially in Newfoundland. So that's our main concern. So for people who are out hunting, I guess in this case, these are people who are out hunting tur. Yep. Um, 
how important is it to try and keep the shells inside the boat? Uh, I think if you can make an effort, make the effort, obviously. Uh, if something goes overboard, don't swim after it. That might not be worth it. Uh, but always, like there, there are bigger scale and smaller scale actions you can take, right? Like uh, as a citizen, putting pressure on government is going to be more effective than picking up one shell. But if you see a shell, pick it up, obviously. Yeah. So you said shells are just a small part of the ocean, or the plastics rather, that make it into the ocean. What is the bulk of the plastic that's out there? In Newfoundland, it's fishing gear. Uh, so there, we also found when we look for shell, this, this green twine. And we have found this exact green twine not this exact one, but this kind of green, in every single animal's belly we've ever looked in. Cod, uh, birds, we always find this little green thing on shorelines, in our trawl nets, our surface trawl nets, we always find these. Um, there's a, during, right after the cod moratorium, we were still losing uh, 10,000 nets a year, uh, gill nets, and those just keep going, they keep fishing, and then they fragment into smaller and smaller pieces. So that is the largest source of plastics, uh, plastic pollution in Newfoundland. And what's the solution to all this plastic that makes its way into the ocean? Well, for fishing gear, it's a bit hard because there aren't non-plastic fishing gears, although we have been talking to some fishermen, especially ones who do smaller scale uh, fishing, about heritage fishing techniques that don't use plastic, and then they can also repair their own nets. Uh, but about 60% of all plastics produced in the world are for disposables. So stopping the creation of disposables, right? So not just uh, litter problems or consumer choice problems, because the plastics are already made. And once they're made, they exist. They're going to outlast the human species. Doesn't matter what you do with them. So keeping them from being created in the first place is definitely the best and really only way to mitigate marine plastics. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. I just have to say, every time I hear somebody like that talking about the issue of plastics in the environment, it is so disturbing. Yeah, it we, is. We really have to get a handle on it, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and we had a little different start to our day. We you did. And, um, we had a little bit of a field trip. Yeah, we went without you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah no, we uh, <laughs> were representing. Yeah, we visited. I was there in spirit. Yeah, we visited an elementary school in Upper Gullies in CBS. It is Literacy yeah, Week, look who's and there. we were invited there. I am with this fine crowd of grade five students. Yeah. That, by the way, was Ms. Cooper's class. No relation to me. <laughs> and there I am in Ms. Ivy's class. Uh, we were reading to some of the students today. I uh, yeah. got a chance to read a couple of books uh, and answer a few questions. Yeah, and same with my class as well. They had some great questions, very attentive, and I really appreciated being there. So thank you all, Ms. Cooper's students and... Yeah, Ms. Ivy's students as well. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Um, may the fourth be with you, uh -huh. I knew and it Peter. had to happen. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, today is Star Wars Day, and I had to incorporate it somehow into the weather. And I will say, whether you're a Star Wars fan or not, there's a disturbance in the force. I can feel it, <laughs> and it is in the form of a blocking high for next week. So uh, how come you didn't wear that outfit on <laughs> yeah. the show today, Ryan? I couldn't yeah. find it. I couldn't find one. Uh, you were game, though, were I you? was totally game. <laughs> the weather dark side. That's right. Perhaps for next year. Uh, and like the blocking high, the blocking high is a lot like Darth Vader. Uh, whenever it makes an appearance, it's usually not a good thing. And uh, as we look ahead to next week, that's certainly going to be the case as uh, Vader brings on the dark side of uh, weather in terms of oh, that blocking high setting up next week. We're talking about onshore winds, RDF, cooler than average temperatures. We're going to be uh, breaking that down in just a second. Here's how it's all going to play out. There's our first low, which is departing as we speak into the North Atlantic. Uh, Clearing out quite nicely for Friday. Bit of a northwesterly wind, keeping a bit of a chill into the air into the morning. But as the area of high pressure moves in overhead for the afternoon, winds are going to become lighter. And that should allow our temperatures to top out in the 9, 10 degree range for most, even along that northeast coast. A tad cooler in those onshore winds. And note, temperatures across Labrador will range from the freezing mark in the north, uh, just above the freezing mark in the west, to as warm as 4 or 5 degrees in the southeast. So we roll ahead to Saturday. Uh, area of high pressure will actually hold on, and this blocking will actually start to occur over our neck of the woods first, keeping 
Central and eastern parts of Newfoundland and the northeast, even up into coastal Labrador, dry on Saturday. But our next system rolling into Lab West and with a scattered shower risk over western parts of Newfoundland as well. Note for Saturday afternoon, I think the northerly wind is a little more dominant here. And so temperatures along the coast likely in the 6, 7, 8 degree range. Inland should get to 10 to as warm as 12 degrees. 14 for central, the west coast. Afternoon showers, as I mentioned, but still likely topping out near 12 degrees. Afternoon showers for Happy Valley, Goose Bay and eastern Labrador. Snow will change to rain in Lab West. Now, Saturday afternoon into Sunday, the system will continue to roll to the north. It's a changeover to showers, as I mentioned, for Lab City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay. More scattered shower risks for Cornerbrook and the west coast. More sunshine in the mix for central and eastern Newfoundland. And I think with this area of high pressure right overhead, winds are a little bit lighter on Sunday. More variable sea breeze setup, and so temperatures have the potential to be a little bit warmer. Again, I still think we'll see variable temps in the metro region ranging from 8 to 10 degrees closer to the coast uh, to as warm as, uh, yeah, that 14, even 15 degree range as you work your way into the central parts of the Avalon. 15 to 16 in central, scattered showers in the west with 15 degrees there. And yes, some mild temperatures in Labrador. And there is the blocking high setup next week. Cue the Darth Vader music. If we could afford it, we would play it. But again, copyright protection uh, inhibits us from doing that. And there's the setup uh, with that dominant onshore flow for next week, Tuesday into Wednesday and beyond. Uh, Thursday, possibly Friday as well. And you can see that will have RDF in the mix with those cool onshore winds. And so we'll want to enjoy these next couple of days. Again, not as much of a factor towards the west coast of the island as well as Labrador. But either way, uh, we're keeping an eye on that setup for next week. Okay, thanks Ryan. And it is time now to meet our athlete of the day. Uh, and tonight we have two for you. This is Dalton Mahoney from Harbor Breton. He's nine years old and is goalie for the Harbor Breton Hurricane Adam team. This is his first year as a netminder and he works hard to keep the other team from scoring. That's right. And we want to show you last night's athlete of the day again because we told his family he'd be on tonight, not last night. We want to make sure he, uh, all his friends and family get to see him. And there he is again. That's Andrew Woodford from Seal Cove. Andrew, six years old, plays hockey with the Timbit Rhinos. Besides hockey, he enjoys baseball, swimming, and taekwondo. Way to go, Andrew. You are today's Young Athlete of the Day. One of the most senior members of the royal family is stepping back from his public appearances. Buckingham Palace's Prince Philip has decided it's time for a change. Details after the break.
back to here and now. He's been on the job for almost 70 years and made more than 22,000 public appearances. But today, Buckingham Palace says Prince Philip is retiring, sort of. The Queen's husband wants to slow down starting in September, but not before a few more royal tasks, including one today. Thomas Daggle reports. Spry for a 95-year-old. There he was again today. Prince Philip at his usual spot right by the Queen, smiling. He spent 110 days last year doing just this, attending public engagements. This one today at St. James's Palace in London, where he joked about hearing aids and that news of the day. I'm sorry, you're standing down. I cannot stand up much. Also in the room, yes, that's former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, who chatted with the Duke of Edinburgh at today's Order of Merit service. Just explained to me that he was less comfortable than he used to be in crowds. And, uh, and uh, you know, so he said, I will keep doing a lot of things, but I don't want to be forced to get out as much as I was doing in the past. Buckingham Palace announced today, as of September, the Duke will not be accepting new invitations for visits and engagements, although he may still choose to attend certain public events from time to time. I think he'll be um, still very actively involved in national life, but he will choose the things that he can do and wants to do. For 70 years, Philip has stood by Elizabeth, though not always silently, first as husband to the princess, then consort to the longest serving queen in history. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. Officially, the queen isn't scaling back her duties, though the Duke will be by her side in public less often. A retirement that signals more responsibility for the younger royals. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. The flooding situation in Quebec is getting worse. There's more rain in the forecast and municipalities are bracing for more flooding. This video was recorded in Gatineau across the river from Ottawa. As of today, more than 220 people and at least 24 animals have been forced from 130 residences. Government officials across Quebec are preparing shelters for those who've been displaced. Sandbags are also available for people who want to try to protect their homes. Wow, well, if anything's on fire, it's these dance moves. This is a firefighter in Arkansas. He was directing traffic during a storm over the weekend when he decided to uh, lighten things up a bit. <laughs> he sure can move as fast as lightning with expert timing. Certainly one way to get a kick of energy on the job. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs>
Local film Maudie has brought in more than a million dollars at cinemas throughout Canada. It shines a spotlight on the life of Nova Scotia folk artist Maud Lewis. Now, the film was shot in Newfoundland, and two of the province's best filmmakers were involved, producer Mary Sexton and writer Sherry White. The two-hour feature film uh -huh. has had good reviews since opening in mid-April. It's now showing at 82 cinemas across the country, including two in this province. So, if you're in St. John's or Cornerbrook, you can head down to your local cineplex to check it out. Well, the CFL's top prize showed up in St. John's today. Jeff Hunt, who's originally from this province, is one of the owners of the Grey Cup champion, Ottawa Red Blacks. He, along with two of his players, brought the trophy to the House of Assembly today. That's where some politicians struck up their best sports poses. Following that, the Red Blacks players headed out to the Technoplex. That's where they met some young football enthusiasts to put them through their bases. It's going to be a linebacker. <laughs> Well, uh, winter may have officially ended in March. Uh, but in Dawson City, the real end comes with the Yukon River breakup. The ice broke yesterday morning. It's a little hard to see here, but onlookers say that much anticipated breakup was, admittedly, a little anticlimactic. Regardless, cheers and relief that another winter is behind them. <laughs> you must have to stand there for a long time waiting for the, uh, those uh, cracks to first appear. But there it goes, starting to move. I wonder if they want to speed things up. Could they throw a bit of dynamite in there? And uh, br that's yeah, it's probably cheating. Yeah, you're right. You can't cheat spring. Uh, we all know that. And uh, yeah, temperatures tomorrow are going to be cool, especially to start the day. Uh, note the northwest winds. They're going to start near 30 to 50 from St. John's up the northeast coast towards St. Anthony. Uh, but will ease into the afternoon as an area of high pressure comes in. We're actually going to see southwest winds develop over the west coast. So onshore winds. Keeping temps as cool as 8, but away from the onshore winds as warm as 13 degrees. Again, should top out late afternoon near 10 in St. John's. And temperatures not too bad in Labrador. And I believe that I have a picture here. Maybe I forgot to load it in. There, there it is. is. Oh, it's worth waiting for. Definitely a huge iceberg over the Grand Banks. And this one from Mark Edwards and his crew who were out crab fishing on the Grand Banks. A little and close to that iceberg for my yeah, liking. I'm thinking but there's a big zoom on the lens there. Uh, they're really <laughs> far away, but zoomed in. But uh, yeah, what a great picture. Again, Facebook.com and Instagram. I'm always looking for your photos. Okay, that's our program for tonight. Thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. Good Have a good night. night.